recording. All right, so today we switch here a little bit. We talk about computer system, we talk computer network, right? And you are basically going through the the material, to be honest, from I would say one of the best people in the country on those topics, for sure, right? for sure. I can assure you they're really, really good at um, uh, the, the, the content, right? And, and making sure you've got the right thing and not hopefully not too much because this is an intro, still kind of intro to computer system. And now today I'm gonna switch here and talk about how to build a computer. In particular, we will talk about computer architecture. Right. So before we begin, um, let me first welcome you to the third modules of this class. Uh, we'll talk about what this part of the class, to be honest, is about what you're getting into and your expectation. But it's the same as the earlier two modules. So hopefully if you're having fun so far, it'd be fun. If you are not having fun so far, I hope it'd be fun. <laughs> um, recommended reading on the syllabus will be updated as demand. So you, if you have any questions that the Hennessy and Patterson, uh, uh, as well as the Yale Pat uh, textbook doesn't really, really give you, uh, let me know because uh, most of the topics discussed in this computer architecture textbook required you to know a basic digital design, which basically kind of involve around how do I build the logic that would add to numbers? How do I build the logic that we would do if else? And we'll kind of touch on it a little bit today, but it won't, it won't be, it will not be the focus of this class. Especially because this is a computer science program, not computer engineering, I will not expect you to be well versed in digital design, right? But we'll still learn how how does someone build a computer and what makes a good computer right so the admin stuff i would like to actually talk a little bit more about myself because this is basically where i would like to uh, uh introduce my expertise uh so my main expertise is computer architecture i graduate with a phd and my thesis focused on how to build a better gpu is actually right in the computer architecture topic. Uh, I have a side topic of things like high performance computing, file system, and sort of systems that have worked with my colleagues. Um, if you are interested, definitely let me know. I'm personally on a mission to build the architecture community in Southeast Asia uh, uh, with my colleagues, uh, both in Singapore and in Australia, and hopefully. Hopefully we have a, a, a both better job offering for people who are interested in this field as well as a better mentorship program. Uh, I can tell you it's kind of like tough if you're interested in this area because in Thailand, I can tell you I'm the only one on working on this topic, literally the only professor in Thailand uh, uh, that graduate and 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 I can call myself expert on this topic. No one else are. So it's hard to find mentor, right? Um, my lab is working on right now scalable data centric architecture, which basically sounds like weird and you might not really understand what, what it is, but let me go a little bit more into detail on, uh, we want to be able to build the system, including the hardware that can handle a lot of data because these day and age, everything you do, basically you process the data. So you want to think of data as your, basically as the central theme of the way you build computer, right? In order to get better performance, who doesn't want a faster computer? Also at low cost, who doesn't want a cheap computer? All right, uh, we did have internships and uh, also if you are curious about projects, uh, anyone here know Justin and Nawat who, uh, who were the TA for system skill from last semester? Yeah, so they are, they are helping my PhD students building uh, the, if you know something like P, P2 from, from this class, 
basically what they are working on and helping my PhD student right now is basically built the uh, the the function called that handle network interface, so that we can do what we call federated learning. Federated learning is is the techniques that Google use to improve on autocorrect for your Google keyboard. If you use Android, they actually train whatever you type in. <laughs> they use the data to train the model. They send it to the central server, but they don't send the raw data. They send the train model that are from each device. And the central server kind of merge them together into a global model so that my device would be more trained for Thai language, while someone else would be more trained for um, the English language, right? So they can build a better global model that kind of include all, every single language, every single style, and would work for autocorrect. Uh, so this is something we do, but we don't work on the machine learning part. We work on the system design, how to make it scalable. How can I include even more devices? If I use the same techniques on IoT that in smart form application and my device are in the middle of the field, I don't have a good internet connection, what can I do? So these are some of the things that we are working on right now. Uh, and there are many more projects. I'll touch a little bit on, if you know architecture, what can you do? Uh, and if you're curious about that, feel free to let me know. I'm, I'm really open to like having any of you here. You, as I said, my experience with and UIC students, you guys are awesome. Better, to be honest, I would say better than, than most of the interns from the other universities that, that we took in so far. So if, if you're interested in these kind of research-based projects, definitely let me know. And now I would like to know a little bit more about you. Like, have you heard about these words, like ISA? Anyone remember this word from system skill? Anyone? How many people remember the word assembly? Yeah, so, so I guess an assembly kind of go hand to hand, right? At the end of the day, if you want to build a computer, you also need to build a tool that we can program, right? Because we, we're gonna talk a little bit about this topic in this class. We also talk extensively about caching. So we will go beyond what we know from system skill and talk about what does the hardware do to make caching better, right? We also uh, will touch base on uh, the X86 ISA and the discussion about other ISA like RISC V, MIPS, and and um, ARM ISA. Anyone here heard about this Tensor Core Tensor Processing Unit or the TPU? Anyone? Yeah, it's for machine learning. Yes, thank you. It's kind of like a, a, a processor that's designed to do a metrics multiply because a lot of the workload uh, is, is a vector and vector multiply. So these units are designed to make sure you can do those operations really, really quickly. Graphic prop, anyone here doesn't play games? Or oh, anyone here like playing games like myself? I, I do play games. Well, at least before I had my daughter. <laughs> no, I don't really have a, uh, a lot of time to play games. Anyone here like playing games? You all use the GPU, right? Yeah, I yeah, do. I mean, to be honest, right? I can tell you the reason why I go into computer science in the first place is I want to learn how game is built. <laughs> as bad of a motivator as that? Yeah, I'm like, yeah, sure. And then I got into the, the, the my kind of like the theme for my thesis was like, well, I'm not good enough to build a, the, the, the game, but I would like to learn how to build a GPU. <laughs> so actually that's my motivation. And it kind of got me here, right? So we use the GPU a lot, not just playing game too. These days we use it for machine learning. We use it for uh, uh, bioinformatics, right? So you can use the GPU for many other powerful applications that have real world impact. Uh, you might have heard about the term edge devices or IoT, right? These are embedded processes connected in a huge network. That's why they coined the term Internet of Things. Things are devices, Internet are you connect those together, and somehow you have to manage those. Hey, good luck, right? 
so it can be a pain from the system point of view once you have 10,000 of those devices connected because those devices are really weak. <laughs> they are embedded processor, it's like tiny computer. They, they are not capable of doing like fancy things, but somehow you want to actually be able to uh, get a lot of things done, right? From the system, you want to be efficient, right? Efficient is the key. Efficiency is always the key in many uh, uh, real life scenario, right? Uh, cloud and serverless computing are also another big thing that are happening right now, right? You want to run something and you don't have a computer for that, you can rent the time from Amazon AWS. Anyone wondering like how did Amazon manage that data center? How many people want to be an engineer behind AWS? Or are just curious about how can I be one? So the topics that we learned from this class, the computer system, network, and architecture are the core of being a good, uh, I would say cloud engineer, right? being able to build an infrastructure that can handle a lot of uh, clients. Uh, yeah, so that's a question on the chat. Is it possible to build something better than 3090? So that's, a, you mean the 3090 GPU, right? Of course, yes. And I can tell you, that's gonna be more and more and more hat like the GPU coming out for sure. To be honest, Intel are uh, starting to have their own GPU as well. They are, they are actually launching another, uh, actually it was kind of like that second attempt or I'll say third attempt. The first attempt was like on your GP, uh, GPU, you have it now on your Intel CPU, right? Uh, oh yeah, that's another one too, a good one. Um, the NVIDIA A100 was basically the, uh, I would say server scale, large scale, uh, data center scale GPU for use in machine learning and and many scientific applications, right? Uh, oh yeah, that too. So I think Nvidia got hacked <laughs> last week. Yeah, Nvidia got hacked. Uh, I've heard that the the hacker was trying to like kind of like modify the driver license. So if you use NVIDIA driver from 2004, uh, 15 downward, anything older than that, uh, Microsoft will and verify that it becomes legit when you have the hack driver. Uh, so update your, uh, update your drivers, guys. Um, and, and hacking and getting hacked uh, are becoming a norm. All right, so it's good to computer system and know how to kind of secure yourself uh, a little bit, right? Uh, and this is one of the major flaw of the IT industry in Thailand. We got hacked all the time. <laughs> so when get, getting hacked and somehow the data is leaking out. It's like oozing out from the pool that they have. Unintentionally, of course. Uh, but yeah, A100 was uh, right now kind of like the state of the art, uh, the best cluster of GPU you can buy. Uh, it is really energy efficient, to a really large amount of DRAM bandwidth. So one of the main difference of newer generation with the GPU is the cards that you use to play games. Um, instead of a technology called GDDR6, with the kind of the extension to your DRAM, it uses a different technology called high bandwidth memory, which stack. It actually put DRAM on top of each other. So you get way more bandwidth in the package and actually better capacity as well, right? So, so the Ampere architecture, every single architecture, we change the hardware. You are, uh, if you're gonna keep pursuing this architectural topics, your job market, Intel, Nvidia, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Qualcomm. So those company hire tons and tons and tons of computer architects to design the hardware for them, 
trade. Uh, have the industry in Thailand right now for that because it's it's cheap design. It it does take uh, a lot of capital, right? Um, but still, it's it's a it, it's actually booming right now. Uh, there were a lot of as well as the company in China like Alibaba, Huawei. They also hiring a tons of uh system and to build the 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 that one platform, that one hardware. So going back to the A100, yeah, so that that one generation. 3090 was the top of the line for the like desktop scenario, right? Your own machine. And I can bet you next year better GPU coming out. I'm so aware of the different kind of like a fundamentally different GPU design that hopefully would give you even better performance that are coming up hopefully in less than five years, right? Um, they also so attempt to make GPU more programmable, more, more like a CPU, but at the same energy efficiency, right? So yeah, thank you, this consumer product. Sorry, yeah. Uh, <laughs> my English, uh, English skill getting worse and worse. Uh, so yeah, so these are some of the words that you might have heard. And hopefully once we go through some of the basic material here, uh, you see better picture, quote unquote, right? Because only eight classes. Um, I have been wanting to open up a special topic on architecture that would be full blown. How do you design a CPU? Um, for for anyone who is, is interested, uh, for sure. I know that there are a few people that took this class and they were interested. Uh, we just need to have more than seven people interested. So yeah. So what's the goal of this module? Let's come back to the material in the class because I don't want to keep going on a tangential direction and actually want to wrap up the lecture. So the goal of this module is you want to know really how the computer works right what happened when you run a program these are not magic well at least we human doesn't have magic we call that science we want to know the science behind this magical thing that you use to run your program hopefully once you know how the computer works right you can be a better programmer that are aware of what hey what does the hardware do so you can write faster code and allow you to think out the box. This is one of the fun things that I always tell uh, students, which is so far in your CS career, right? You always think this way. I need to modify the software. I need to write a program to make something work, to make something better. Now let's unlock that and say, hey, what about hardware? I can change the hardware too, right? To make sure I reach my goal. So yeah. You can change the hardware. <laughs> as simple as that. It's it's a uh, it's the design of both the hardware and the software and the system, right? That's why we have Linux, Windows, and Mac OS, and different distribution of Linux because they serve different purposes. And what do I expect from you? Hopefully, you know C by default. Uh, yeah. Hopefully, you attend lectures. And hopefully I don't bore you all to hell, right? So if the lecture gets boring, let me know. Because I want to make sure you're excited to some extent and you don't find the lecture too boring. Uh, do all the required work and work hard. And I can assure you P3 is not as bad as P2 and P1, I think. I think. Uh, ask a question and participate in discussion. You've been doing great so far that the chat is kind of lively. Like I, I loved it. I love to go on. If you took my class before, I love to go and discuss about random things in computer science. Um, it's kind of like computer science is my passion, right? So, so if if there's any interesting topics coming up, I would like to talk about it. Uh, and this is the best way to learn because it's not just asking me to like feed you what I want to tell you. It allows you to tell me, right? Hey, I want to learn more about X and Y and Z. Right, and don't procrastinate on your assignment because that's only one of them. So when you procrastinate, it means that one is gonna be over the deadline. 
And this is the last module. We don't have the room after the semester to go over the deadline. It's not hard, but it can be confusing during the last segment of the assignment where you want to make it faster, right? And the usual collaboration policy is okay to brainstorm. It's okay to discuss topics we learn in class. It's okay to talk about high level direction of your assignments. Don't copy your friend's code or look at your friend's code. Please, guys, please. Uh, and I don't tolerate plagiarism uh, of any kind. And uh, this, because this is like the the more uh, senior class, right? I'm gonna treat you all professionally. So I'm gonna be a little bit more strict, right? Uh, on on plagiarism. So yeah, it's it's your chance to learn. I would like to spin it this way. P3 is not that hard to get it right. So challenge yourself and see how far can you go, right? So challenge, the, the keyword is challenge yourself because I feel like you all do well based on at least last semester. Like everyone did really well for P3. And then for the extra credit of P3, that's where you challenge your, yourself and your friends say, who, who, who can get the fastest code out there, right? So that's P3, code optimization. We are going to ask you to optimize the code to improve the cache hit rate, to make it parallel. And those two alone can actually make your metrics multiply a uh, function call really fast. Those two hardware concepts alone, right? So hopefully now the admin stuff is clear. Let's talk about uh, what is computer architecture, right? So we design a computer. It's as simple as that. It's one of the oldest area in computer science, right? We build a computer and there's a lot of science behind it because we need physics and we need math to build a co function computer. We need to know the electrical circuits. We'll kind of abstract away all of that and talk about some of the key trade-offs. Hopefully, if you want to be a full-blown architect, hopefully you know how the circuit works, right? How the electron would move around in the wires. If I put my finger on a on an electrical plug, I will. What 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 would happen to me? If I suddenly poke my finger into into an electrical outlet, assuming I can do that, yeah, I get talk, right? Because what? Because there's a current, an electrical current going through my body and I'll probably die. So you want to know the physics of how electricity works, right? And to be honest, there's more to it than that. But right now for the purpose of our class, high school physics is good enough. You want to be fundamentally understand the software. But I assume you are in a CS degree, that's a given. You know how to write a program. And you want to build a machine that would match the user demand. And that's important because you want to make sure you don't build a computer that costs too much. You don't want to buy a fancy computer for features that you know you're never going to use, right? If you want to buy a GPU to play games, you don't need to buy the A100, right? My computer, I think I use one of the older ATI uh, graphic cards that can still run most games on the high config, right? And uh, it runs fine, right? So you want to be cost efficient. And this, as I said, is one of the oldest areas in computer science. Without a computer, there's no computer science, right? So we build a computer. And how do we build it, right? So what makes a good computer? What do we care, right? When you buy a computer, what do you care? When you go and go to a Fortune Town or a computer store, what do you care? Well, the obvious one was performance, right? You want to make sure it runs fast, right? Uh, you want a good functionality, right? What? How many people prefer a, a laptop that weighs less 
a really light laptop versus you don't care. Like, say if MacBook Air is as fast as the MacBook Pro, which one do you like more or you don't care? Because some people actually don't care. Like for me, the MacBook Pro is kind of light enough for a lot of people. It's like, hey, if you can buy a MacBook Air, I wouldn't mind shelling maybe 5,000 or 100, uh, I mean, uh, 5,000 to 10,000 10, baht, right, on it. But I mean, it probably would cost more than that. Um, cost is another important thing, right? Uh, yeah, if you're carrying like three kilogram laptops and you have to walk three kilometers every day, yeah, it's gonna be painful on your back. And once you get older, I can assure you, because I was like, right now hope uh I, I think i'm probably like around 15 years older than you guys yes your back will feel the pain right uh usability right something like a surface pro where i can use it as a tablet and work really well with powerpoint is awesome for me because i can just basically draw anything in here right i can do this it's harder to do for me on MacBook, right? So, so usability is another thing that, that I can use to evaluate the design. And there are many other factors, right, to, to, to actually constitute a good computer. Because it's always about the user, right? And our job is to identify and achieve these goals at minimum cost. Because we don't want to charge people too much money. They're not going to buy it if the computer costs too much. Right. And I'm going to adapt uh, the, the, this slide is adapted from my, the advisor of my advisor. So I guess it's kind of like my grandfather advisor. His name is Gail Pat. He's one of the most prominent uh, architects in the world uh, right now. And the, his lecture is really good. So we talk about the role of the architect, right? So you want to be able to look, look backward. If you look at old code, you want to understand the trade-off. What makes it good and what makes it bad? Why is that the case? If you know how the code works when you program and you know what is good about the code and what's bad about the code, you can then evaluate the previous design. And this doesn't actually work for coding as well. It can go to your computer, right? You look back at the older generation of MacBook comparing to right now, and you know, okay, it's too heavy, so you might want to save a little bit more on components and hopefully make sure it doesn't go like beyond two kilograms, right? You want to be able to look forward, right? You want to be able to talk to your friends in software development and see, hey, if I can have a computer behave this way, it'd be awesome. So you know the demand for future applications so that you can keep pushing awesome computer out that would match the user's demand. And you want to be able to look up. Look up means looking up the compute stack. The compute stack, I'm going to go over this in a little bit more, but you want to know the nature of the problems. You want to know the algorithm. So, you, that, so basically you know what are the components that you have to design, what should be fast, what doesn't have to be fast because you don't care. You also want to look down, know the future technology, right? Understand the capability of what we have right now. And then from the top, you want to see, hey, how can I enable future technology from the physics part, from the material science part? How can I have a two terabytes of memory rather than 10, 15 gigabytes or 16 gigabytes of memory, right? That'd be awesome. And actually it's coming out because we have advancement in physics, material science, chemical engineering, right? these awesome material would become your future computer. And now let me talk about the computer stack. And this is basically what you're gonna hear from most people in IT industry in Thailand. So you might have heard about front end, right? And back end. You've seen this, right? 
if you are back end developer, you do DevOps, right? You would go and configure the system, build the system architecture, and hopefully everything put together and it works. If you're front end development, you basically interface with the user, you build the interface, you build the, you call the API that are developed by the people from the back end. Hopefully you can deploy the product. What is that red box? Can someone tell me what goes, what's, what's going on in that red box? It's actually a lot of, it's actually not just the hardware. So we're gonna zoom into this, but this is a great abstraction for most developers and programmers because of why. Why do I just, if, why is it okay for me to just forget about this part? Why is this an awesome abstraction? So let me reiterate the question, right? Would it be easier for my job not to have to worry about the hardware or the OS too much? Is it easier or is it worse as a programmer? Yeah, it's actually easier, right? If you went through the C lecture, you don't, you hit, how many people hit malloc and free and those pointers and say, hey, I want to just work with Python. So that, that's actually, <laughs> you miss Python. So that, that's actually a, a goal, right? We want to be able to abstract away the hard stuff, right? Why is that again? You want to manage that for you, right? But if you can assume this in, right? The compute stack looks like this. You have the problem that convert to the algorithm, right? So if you're in the algorithm class, you will learn the graph algorithm that can be used to tackle certain problems. You will learn search algorithm that can be used to tackle a different set of problems. You will learn how to sort. You will learn how to do sort quickly, right? Then you write a program. Once you write a program, what happened? How do you run it? How do you run a program? You would first compile, right? You would first compile so that the program that you write change from the human readable program into something that computer recognize, right? Then Windows, Linux, and Mac OS will take that program that you compile and run it. So that's a runtime system, right? So that, that's the first modules that you went through, as well as the second modules that you went through. The runtime system and a network component, those are kind of like a system level. Then you go down where you see the ISA, the microarchitecture, right? These are the hardware. Because you essentially you do all those computation in hardware, and then you go down logic devices and electrons, right? Um, and the design choice that we do from the hardware would affect the user, right? You can't run a CPU application on a GPU without a significant changes. And vice versa, you can't just pick a graphic application and with no changes whatsoever, run on a CPU. And what we do as an architect and system designer, we link the gate and wires right, to the computer codes that you write. So we kind of like the bridge between the physics and the, the, the actual physical component to the hardware. So what are the benefit of knowing the hardware? Like, most of you here would end up being a programmer and you're going to be a good programmer. I believe, I totally believe in you. Like you're going to be a good developers, but you might be asking, why do I care? Why do I need to sit through my lecture? So what if, right? Your code runs slow. You, your code consumes too much energy, right? How many people play games on mobile phone and somehow it use all the battery in like two hours? Right, so energy efficiency is it's getting more important, right? So if you know how the hardware works, you can actually optimize for energy. 
uh, you can switch to a, com a new computer, right? And somehow your code runs slower, even though you just bought a computer and you were disappointed. How many people run into that scenario before? You buy a new computer, you run the same program, and now it's slower. Anyone have that problem before ever? Right? Somehow it's like just not forward compatible, right? Uh, the program sometimes you switch the computer and produce incorrect results. Sec fault. All right, I believe everyone here went through sec fault. Sec fault, sec fault. Anyone hit sec fault? Right? Sec fault is a system features actually that allows you to stop the program from running because it's unsafe to keep running. And that's really annoying for the programmer, right? But if you want to know, if you know the nature of why this happened, you would know, okay, you need to check allocation and how you access the data because that's the cause of sec fault. It allows you to be a, 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 be a, do a better job at debugging your code. Uh, sometimes your code just make computer hangs. I write a code like that before. I'm like, oh, what happened? And then debug my code and I realized that I use a lot of swap space. <laughs> I have memory leaks in a program. Yay, right? So these can happen. If you know the hardware, you can, you, basically it's a lot, it's, it's a tool that help you debugging. Sometimes your code shuts down a computer. I also did that before, but, uh, but those were intentional, right? I was trying to show, uh, we, uh, we were trying to show that I can launch a GPU application and I do something with it and the computer would shut down because I used too much of the resource and the GPU doesn't have all those resources. Right. So at minimum, it helps when you browse the Stack Overflow. Who doesn't do that? Anyone here use the Stack Overflow all the time? Yeah, it's a failure, right? Just, just use it. So knowing the hardware, knowing system topics, knowing the module one, module two, and module three in this class allows you to understand the explanation in the Stack Overflow better. That alone, right? That alone will save so much of your time. Right? As a programmer, you can save a lot of time because you now understand a little bit more about system stuff, network stuff, and hardware stuff, right? What else? Right? More reasons. Advanced in hardware enabling new technology part I find fun. Right? This is basically kind of uh kind of keep me motivated about this topic because hardware for modern day machine learning, right? If I can use a GPU for that, it's actually now shifting toward more of the CPU side as well. So I can change the hardware. I can use new hard IoT application so that it can be more power efficient. It meet the deadlines, right? It can improve reliability. You can build a cool new graphic card for New video games. How um, when we all like really really cool graphic videos, right? And you might have realized that the games that you play today, comparing to five years ago, the quality of the graphics is different. It's so different. If you look at from the, the game today to five years ago, and if you compare the five years ago games to ten years ago, you're gonna see another set of like. Hey, did you just play that 10 years ago? It looks, it were, right? Back in the day, it looks awesome, but now it's like, it looks kind of weird, right? Because we have better hardware, right? So what are modern day workloads, right? You can have the AI application and do use this framework called PyTorch or TensorFlow to train your model. IoT applications, you have a, a big data center, right? Or even mobile application where you want to coordinate between a lot of phones together for an app, right? Or COVID, right? If you look, it's basically this graph is what we call the phylogeny tree, right? That can track how many strain of mutation that happen. Right? Why do we need that? So that we can make a better vaccine, made a better drugs for uh uh for people, right? This is literally 
life saving, right? And all these things demand one core, uh, I guess, advances, better hardware, right? So these things demand better hardware. It requires good system design. You can't just say, hey, I'm gonna clock my CPU from 3.6 to 3.8 gigahertz, add two more cores, and that's it. These days you need to design the system. These days you need to design the hardware to make sure you squeeze out every single bit of the performance so that you can handle a diverse type of workload that want to use the computer, right? And and one thing I would kind of wrap up is like, it actually does impact a lot of modern applications, right? And I'm gonna go through some obvious real world example. So this is your project, right? The block metrics multiply. This is the first step at making your metrics multiply faster. It improves cache hit rate, right? What application you use on this? Turns out machine learning, right? What if you can do that in parallel, like using the GPU to run it, then you can even get a better performance, right? So you can do training on the GPU. So now let me go over, what about if I run machine learning on GPU, what are the problem, right? So in modern system, aside from playing games, you might've seen some of these slides before I use it for my uh, talk as well. Um, so aside from playing these games, which I did play all of them, um, I can use the GPU to run this scientific application as well, right? And this is old, uh, an older uh, GPU, the Titan X. These say you have the A100 and then fancy GPU that offer a lot of parallelisms. But if you don't know how to use the GPU, the GPU can be actually really slow, even slower than the CPU, right? The A100 is really powerful, but you need to know the hardware because your program has to be super parallel. Like we call this embarrassingly parallel. You have to be able to do the thousand and thousand and thousand of add and multiply all in parallel, right? It has to contain the same operation. Something like metrics multiply is perfect, right? Otherwise it's gonna be super slow. It's gonna be really slow, slower than a CPU, right? So what can you do? If you buy a fancy GPU and you know the hardware, now you can change the algorithm so that it use the GPU better, right? So if you know the hardware is enabling you to buy, like basically rewrite the program so that it's really, really fast. It can be hundred times faster than before you rewrite the program. What are other problems? If we want to, anyone remember virtual memory? Anyone? Ah, yeah. Nightmare from a uh, system. Yeah, yeah you, you did really well on the exam. So I believe you you at least know what what's virtual memory to some extent, right? It's being used to give you memory protection. And the the notion of I have like contiguous chunk of memory that a program that I'm writing can work with. So the GPU does have virtual memory as well, right? And it does have the TLB, every structure that we talk about from the system scale. And it has its own main memory on the GPU side, right? And then the problem that we found, this is actually my thesis. My thesis, we found that the problem is I don't have enough TLB. It's too small. You can't just make it bigger. It's too costly. And then whenever you don't have that entry in the TLB and you have to do the page walk, you are doing tons and tons and tons of page walk at the same time. It's not one page walk anymore, like a CPU world. Now you have eight, 16 page walk. On top of that, if your data is not on the GPU side, you have to bring the data over from a CPU. So these things make the GPU a lot slower as well. When you want to put this GPU in the cloud, you want to share the GPU in the cloud, this thing would make the GPU slower. So it kind of demand for a new virtual memory design. So we actually did work on uh, improving, right? The, the, the design of how the GPU works, uh, 
and fundamentally propose a new memory management is still some of these topics are still going on, but at the end of the day, we have better sharing in the cloud, better CPU performance, better GPU utilization. Uh, you don't have to modify anything from the program point of view. Again, abstraction, right? I don't have to change my program. Yay. Uh, and ended up having better support for large application like AI, IoT, deep learning, big data applications. It's like a, a joint project. Uh, as I said, it was my thesis. I was working with uh, folks from VMware Research, uh, UT Austin. Uh, right now, I still have a project with student at UT Austin on kind of basically uh, something on this topic as well. Uh, so if you're interested in in these direction, definitely let let me know. Uh, and what else, right? Aside from a new design, right, to support new hardware, you can also look at mobile application, IoT, and cloud too, right? So I'm gonna talk about another separate work that I was working with uh, a researcher at uh, in Hong Kong. So we discovered that if you run application, right, Google Map, Google Earth, YouTube, Facebook, these are common application, like we didn't use TikTok and Facebook at some point in time, right? Chrome, right? Or um, uh, Candy Crush, right? Or Twitter, right? It turns out the way Android manage the file is just store everything. <laughs> they literally store all the file that they download, right? So what's the downside of that? Can someone guess what's the downside of storing every single file that you download? Yeah, you're gonna use a lot of memory and it's actually with a lot of space that, that is limited, right? Your phone, it's not your desktop, right? Your phone has a much more limited memory. So, ended up you are either going to be clearing a lot of this like you need to close the program or it becomes slow so what do you find like hey some of the files you download you use it again for example right uh, you play games some of the uh loaded file uh image the background in the game you 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 keep loading that file again and again and again and again right the interface for the program for Facebook, for Twitter, you use that again and again and again and again. So this temporary file can use a lot, right? But some file you download, use it once and you never use it again, right? Your friend's live feed, you browse it once, you never see that again. It happens a lot, right? You browse like TikTok video, you watch it for one time and you never watch it again. Do I need to store that video on, on my machine as a cache? No, right? Yeah. Or, or stream games in the library, I never get to play, right? So those things, we, we realized that, hey, you, you can actually improve the system that way. So we actually changed the way you would manage the file based on its type, right? Because it, it's not easy to say, I'm going to tap every single file and tell the machine that I'm going to use this, I'm going to use this, I'm going to use this, I'm going to use this. It's hard. We basically use machine learning techniques to tap automatically so that you know, okay, can I throw that data away or do I have to keep that on my uh, mobile phone, right? To get a better IO performance and make it fast. Also, we get a better reliability too, because the more you download, the easier for your SSD and your memory to go out because you write to that too many times, right? So there was a, as I said, there's a, a, a joint collaboration uh, for uh, 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 me and then the researcher at City University of Hong Kong and Huawei in Shanghai. Um, so we actually get to have two papers already uh, published the last one being published and presented uh, literally three weeks ago. And um, we are still working on this, but more on the security front uh, as well. So if anyone is interested, definitely let me know. Um, the researcher is gonna go and become the professor at the uni university in China as well. So if you're kind of looking for a PhD program, do let me know. 
What else? If you know architecture, how many of you heard about this term called microservices or cloud computing? Or container or Docker? So what is a container? Anyone used it before? Anyone used it before? Yeah, like if you have a Docker, right? What it essentially is, is you have this physical hardware, right? And then you create the container where you can run the application and each of these container, they don't really talk to each other. They, they kind of like encapsulate in this, as the name suggests, container. And that's a container engine that allow each container to run on the physical hardware, right? So this is basically the assumption behind uh, Docker and most of the container technology, right? So what is serverless? Serverless is basically breaking this down even further. So instead of application, yeah, they, they iso yes, exactly. They give you this isolation for the content. And what's the benefit of that? Actually, now let me follow that up. What's the benefit of me isolating this container? So is it safe for me to run things in a container and then I can assume that no one can touch my data? Yes, right? It give me this benefit of, yeah, add a part that someone else is doing on container number three, not affected at all. It can keep running my own thing, right? There's an asterisk to that statement a little bit. So let's say I have a container that want to attack the system. I can try to use the container in a way that all the resources, they are being pulled by me. So everyone else becoming slower. Uh, there are attacks like that. Uh, there are ways to prevent that from happening as well, right? The container engine would be responsible for that. Serverless break this down even further. Instead of an application, you run function call, right? Call function, call function, call function, call function. From the programming point of view, it's kind of like you now write this micro micro function calls that you assume that eventually it can run and then the serverless runtime would manage it so if you look at serverless framework and let's say i have a function that just print hello world right the most basic application ever for every type of language you would just learn how to do hello world first you have a local with your own client and you want to run that on the server even though you said serverless, it does have a server, right? It just, you don't have to manage the server. You have a function call and hopefully it runs. So you would kind of package that. Uh, if you don't use serverless, you can use things like Docker to run this. And if you use Docker, you kind of have to configure this a little bit on how to run the app, right? Uh, and then it would get launched at the server. And this, if you look server, uh, you look at serverless framework. The operation is, let's say you use Facebook, right? You have a request saying, "Hey, I want to stop my friend and see what they're up to, see if they be to any interesting restaurant that I can go and check it out too." Because I'm kind of bored with like COVID and stuck at home, and I want to see any cool place I can order food from, right? So I send in a request and see what everyone's doing. So there'll be an API gateway that takes in the request. The request would get assigned by your old friend work address, right? From T1. Uh, that would pick up the request and service them. Some of them would go and query things in the database. Some of them would go and look up things in the shared database. And you get results back to the worker and send it back to the API gateway and send it back to your uh, uh, clients, right? where you are opening a Facebook. So these are the operations. And even though I said serverless, someone need to manage the server, right? So the key here as an architect and also including what you learned from module number one and modules number two is how do you manage this? 
<laughs> not easy, right? How are you going to manage this? So, so it's actually a key question that we don't know the optimal way to manage it yet. And hopefully, hopefully this get better and better and better. I said, okay, because we can run more fancy application on my hardware. Right. And now when talking about running fancy application on my hardware, let's look at the other end of the spectrum for architects. What can they do? They can also propose their own hardware as well. Anyone heard about this word accelerator? So what does accelerate mean? Anyone here? Oh, this is for everyone. Yeah, it's just make it run faster, right? We want to accelerate things. So hardware accelerators means that let's say I run something on a CPU and I say, hey, that's not fast enough. I need it faster. It doesn't really meet my real-time deadline or something like that. I want them to be faster. I can build my own hardware just for that task, right? Some of the example includes things like I can propose to use this technology called resistive, resistive RAM, right? To do a metrics multiply for my convolutional neural network, which is one of the machine learning algorithm, right? Why is that better? I have a lot of internal bandwidth. The RAM technology turns out internally they're doing a metrics multiply anyway, because you're multiplying the <coughs> Uh, the resistance with the current. Anyone remember this equation, V equals IR, from high school physics? What's V? Voltage, right? I is current. It's Ohm's law. Yes, thank you. All right? <clears throat> and because it does follow Ohm's law, I get something modified by something. I can use this to do metrics modify. So uh, we actually did have a work on uh, how to how to program this, how to actually make it from the machine learning application and say, hey, I want to use this particular acceleration technique, right? Uh, and the kind of enabling this through uh, our design. So this is another possibility from an architecture point of view, right? You can actually propose a totally new hardware design to do certain things. What are other things we can do? We can do DNA sequence alignment as well, right? You can uh, use it to align the, the fraction of your DNA to the reference genome so that we can reconstruct how does your DNA looks like? What's the good in that? What's the benefit of knowing your own DNA? So I can use this to predict whether I'm gonna have cancer in the future or not, right? There were certain genes that if you if it does get expressed, you are likely to get more, uh, you are likely to get certain type of cancer or any genetics related disease, right? So there's a, quite a lot of use from the medical community to actually be able to reconstruct your own DNA. So I can tell what do I do with life and hopefully I can live longer, right? Uh, so we, uh, we can use hardware techniques to sequence the DNA faster, right? Uh, you can do some, something we call processing in memory, which uh, some of the work we've done, we get about 116 times better performance. Uh, you can also use processing in storage to get something like five times better performance. Uh, so that it works on any types of uh, uh, 
technique for DNA sequencing as well, so that we can use this in medical application, right? Uh, so these are some of the reasons why you want to be able to build hardware beyond just, I'm going to build a web application and someone can use it, right? What are more reasons to do this? There's actually quite a lot of demand for people who know the computer system and computer architecture, right? Uh, as I said, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, um, they, they will see this as a beneficial thing to know how to write a fast program, know how to debug a program, know how the hardware actually works. Um, you can further optimize a lot of popular workloads beyond 99% of, 99 of the other programmers can, right? Uh, and I think this, this is basically ap applicable to Thailand, right? So that our community can stop launching something that looks like crap, right? Something like this. Uh, if you're in Thailand last, I think two years ago, right? This was a while ago uh, that uh, they have the website. Uh, this is right around the time COVID hit us. Uh, people can sign up to get government funding support. It turns out once it's launched, it went down. Anyone want to take a guess why? Anyone remember this news if you're in Thailand a few years ago? Uh, well, actually, the reason why this went down was they cannot handle the traffic going to the website. It's as simple as that. And I don't know. It is like parallelisms is is distributed. Uh oh yeah, you remember it's for functional programming. So yeah, if you know how to identify and analyze the system and the design around it, hopefully you have a, a way to reliably, right? Instead of going down, at least just make sure if it is slow, make it slow, it's fine. Or if, if there's too much traffic, right? Maybe work a backup plan instead of just going down. Anyone remember this news where uh, the SMS from one of the major com uh, uh, company in Thailand takes two days to arrive? Classic queuing theory. I don't even know why they, they should be able to estimate the amount of SMS traffic that would happen during the spike, right? And then if they need to expand their bandwidth or throttle, right, basically prevent the injection of the SMS package because you know by the time the network is already full. <coughs> throttle that so that everyone get the SMS uh, but it's not as fast, but not two days, right? And many other things that went down in the past two years from the app that um, had to handle a lot of uh, traffic coming in. Uh, this is like a COVID registration system where somehow they're only able to manage 20K transaction per second. That's a really low bar. I don't even know why 20K. That's a, more than have you read distributed paper, we are talking about millions transactions per second. So with a better system design, we can prevent people from suffering as well because systems are down a lot these days. We use, we benefit from using computer, from using this application. So we want to make them scalable, right? We want to make sure that when the traffic is a lot, when there's a burst in traffic, uh, you want to be able to handle certain things reliably, right? So that's it. That's kind of like hopefully motivate why you want to, to learn more topics. Uh, Sky, yay. Um, yes. <laughs> um, yes, no, when sometimes technology changes as well. So sometimes you have to kind of upgrade the software, <laughs> which I think is what MUIC did, right? But yeah, I can definitely uh, agree that it is actually quite slow back then. Um, yeah. So, 
Should, shall we take a break before we proceed? Maybe five minutes break, or should I just keep going on? Anyone want to take a coffee break? So we will now go into like the first topic we want to learn uh, for this module after I've been <laughs> talking and motivating. So let's do a five minutes break. We'll be back at uh, three, let's do three, uh, 325. All right. Uh, I'm gonna go get water as well. So see you all at 325. Okay, so let's resume the recording. Uh, now we're going to start to transition into asking, well, the first thing is asking what is a computer? So you go and, and, and read uh, like a dictionary uh, definition of a computer, you get something like an electronic device for storing and processing data. Typically in a binary form, according to instructions given to this in a variable program, which is a pretty actually accurate uh, representation of a computer because of multiple keywords that appear here, right? Can someone identify some of the important words in this sentence, in this definition of a computer? So what, what does the computer have to be able to do? Exactly, store and process the data, right? So that's kind of like the first thing. Uh, what else? What else would make a difference between a calculator and a computer? Storing is one of, one of them for sure, right? <clears throat> Any anything that you notice that are interesting from here? You can program them, right? You can have the input as a program and you process and store the data based on a program that you give to the computer. So let me, let me ask you this new question. Uh, this is a new slide. So if you look at the last uh, last year slides you will not say this what is a good computer so let's say how do you program how do you program Let, let's say you have a problem and you are designing an algorithm to fix the problem what is the next thing you do to use a computer Yes, so you would have to compile the program first, but before, even before that, what do you have to do? You need to be able to write a program, right? You, you need to write a program first and then you compile and hopefully you do that quickly. So that's a great answer for sure, right? You, you need to be able to do that quickly and you need to be able to write a program, right? So what does, what is a, language of the computer. So let's say I have a computer, which is a machine, right? What is inside there? How, how do you communicate inside a computer? I'm not taking, I'm not talking about the program that you're writing. Everything inside a computer are what? What is the data format that goes in there? Yes, it's, 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 it's a bunch of binary, right? So somehow from your program, right, program. Right, F. Hello. Right, you feed it to the computer. What else does it have to do? Well, first of all, they need to somehow understand this, right? First of all, you need to make sure the computer understand this part. understand your program. And what else can, does it have to do? I understand your program to make myself useful, me as in a computer. 
what do I have to be able to do? If I have print app hello, what should I be capable of? So if I do print app hello, what what's the program do? What does the program do? It needs yes, exactly, right? So you need to somehow execute the instruction and generate some form of output, right? So that's it, <laughs> that's it. You need to first of all be able to represent your program so that the computer know exactly what it has to do. Execute the command. Take the input, generate the output, right? So everyone uh, uh, at least with me on this high level, right? But the signs behind how do I do this from the left side all the way to the output, that's a different story, right? But the high level is simple. I have a math problem written in a program. I just want to make sure the computer compute that and generate the output somehow, somehow. And when I said somehow is your design, you are the designer because by definition, architect has to design as well. So you, you, it's your own design. How do you, how are you going to convert that program to the output? Right? So let's dive deeper, right? Because if you basically look at the logical function of what's going on in the computer, it's kind of like three main components combined. There's a logic unit. The purpose of the logic unit is to process the data, add, subtract, multiply, and or, right? These are logic units. Let's assume magically you have that. There's also a control signal. Why do I need to have the control signal? So that I know, okay, this is a program that add two numbers together. So you know, okay, I'm gonna take this number, take this number and add them. This is another program that do subtract. So I'm gonna take this number, subtract with this number, produce the output. And then there's a, a storage elements, right? That you store the data with, right? You want to store any temporary data or your output file, right? And then if you look at it physically, you buy a computer. If you somehow break that computer down, don't hammer your computer or do something weird like that. But if you look at your computer and somehow have this microscope, you see that essentially they are a combination of transistor, capacitor, resistor, and wires, right? It's a bunch of bits that when put together and feed in a program, feed in a program that a programmer is writing and run, right? It can do all the tasks defined by the logical function, right? So if you go back to the logical representation of computer, you have the processing part, right? The processing part, is the core component of a computer or a CPU or even a GPU, right? There's a two separate elements. There's a data path and the control. Anyone wants to take a guess what does the control do in the processor? There's a control path and a data path. What does control path do? So let's say I have instruction coming in. What was the job of the control path? Yeah, it's actually control. What do I do? Is that an add? Is that a subtract? Is that a multiply? What do I use? What do I pick for the input for an add or for a multiply? So those are the job of the control path. The data path are the hardware that are there to perform the operation. Basically, this data part of hardware that perform the operation. And the reason why I define this is if you read textbook, you'll see the word control part and data part. 
so that you can tell the difference. One is to use as a way to control what goes in where. And the other one is used as that here's the component that performs adding, storing data, subtracting. So those are the data paths. Then from your CPU, what do you have? What's, where do you store your program? What's the next component of your computer? Where do you store your program? Where do you store your data when you run a program? The memory, right? And the cache, the cache is kind of like in between. So let's let's just use the word memory, but yes, you are correct for sure. Cache and memory, right? That's where you start. You 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 put the you run the program, this it gets copied to the memory. And the processor, the CPU, would interact with the memory to run your program. And then when I'm done, where do I take the input and produce the output to? We call this input and output I.O., right? As obvious as it sounds. This can be your SSD, hard drive, monitor, keyboard, and all the devices connected to the computer. And that's kind of like a communication between all these three elements. So this is kind of like a really, really high level of how does a computer work. You have the brain, you have the memory of the brain, and you have the interface, right? That talks to the environment, like a storage, keyboard, uh, monitor, right? And if you go back and look at this, and I'm gonna go on a tangential direction a, a little bit so that you appreciate how old this is. So if you look at it, digital computing, right? It's been around for quite a long time, right? So one of the uh, programmable machines or some of the examples of that is like mechanical calculator or the checkers loom. Loom is used to kind of like put together threads in the warp so that you create a piece of clothing, right? So you can have different patterns. The image here that I show is a Jackass loom. Many of the name used by NVIDIA GPU, like WAP, actually is kind of like motivated these devices. You see the threads, right? And you see the WAP at the bottom. They put together the threads in a different way. And you program what pattern you want it to show up on the piece of clothing that you are basically putting together, right? Uh, <clears throat> it's a loom, basically, right? Uh, so it's like current top path. Uh, so as you can see, these are kind of cool, that you have different pattern for different threads, right? And it was like around for a long time. Anyone here heard of the, the ENIAC? The machine called ENIAC. Anyone know about this machine? So if you have a chance to go to the University of Pennsylvania, uh, there's a room that looks exactly like this, and it's actually really old. So this was a picture I took uh, back in, what year? So 2006? Uh, I had a chance to visit it, uh, the University of Pennsylvania, um, and they actually archived this machine. It's a real machine uh, built by Eckhart and Moshit. Um, it consists of 80,000 vacuum tubes, can store and process 20 demo digit words. And you, when you want to program, you use all those switches that you see over here and all the plugs you see in the picture, right? Right, from everything here. You basically plug all the switches so that you can program them. And guess what? It weighs 30 tons. Barely how far we've gone. So that was in the 50, right? So in the 40 and 50, there was quite a lot of <clears throat> uh, Starting back in the 40, in the wartime era, you have the ABC uh, machine, you have the uh, German has the C3 and C4. Um, I believe one of them got bombed, actually. 
East Asian game. The film uh, starring Benedict Cumberbatch. It is uh, Oscar nominee as well. Back in 2016 or 17. So they are trying to crack the Enigma machine. And the machine that they built was called the Bombay, right? Uh, there was the machine in the movie, it's called the Bombay. They were a computer. That's a computer, basically. Uh, so if you haven't seen the movie, I definitely recommend it's a great movie. Uh, also, the English on top of the Bombay they in, uh, built to crack another code from the German. So, so you can see that these are machines used during the war. And afterward, afterward, uh, there was an attempt to build the ENIAC. The reason why a lot of people would say ENIAC is kind of like the first digital computer, keyword is digital computer, because if you watch the imitation game, you see a lot of mechanical parts. So most of those things are driven through the electrical current and physical mechanical parts. The ENIAC is a digital solution to building a computer, right? So it's kind of like a grandfather of all the computer. And then there's also the afterwards of EdVac, uh, built by von Neumann and Edzak, which actually, this is the first time you get to program and store the program on the machine. So this is the first machine you can store the program. So all this machine has a lot of different design and how to change, basically, from your program that you're writing the maths equation that you want to solve into the output and the way they do it, they all do that differently. Some of them use a mechanical part, some of them use the electrical signal, some of them represent things in binary. Some of them store the program on the machine, right? So you can see the evolution of this. And now, once you have the store program, there's the advancement in things like programming language and the emergence of software. So that, that's kind of like a dawn of computer science as, as an area, basically as a, a major player in science. Uh, we have Fortran uh, back in 1954, and no one used Fortran anymore. <laughs> we now use things like Python, Java, C, C++, right? Rust, right? These are new, new programming languages designed so that you can have much more powerful way to express your algorithm and so that the hardware can optimize your algorithm much better. We'll talk about optimization by the hardware in, in a bit. There's also an age of Moore's law after that early dawn of com uh, the computer, right? Anyone heard of Moore's law? Anyone heard of Moore's Law? So, Gordon Moore is the one that come up with Moore's Law. Gordon Moore was a co-founder of Intel. And if you didn't know, Intel built a tons of CPU. Back then, they were building integrated circuits, computer chips. And what Gordon Moore realized when they look at their production output is that if you plot right, the number of transistor, the number of transistor against time, you see, well, look at this four data points. Yay, right? So it's not really a full blown technical paper, it's more like an observational kind of thing. Um, you see that the number of transistors that you can cram onto the integrated circuit would double every two years. Anyone here in the algorithm class? Or have been through the algorithm class already? What can you tell about a growth of something that's big O of two to the N? Every two years, you double the transistor. Is that a fast growing number?
that is actually really, really fast, right? So nowadays your computer that are this big, this big, right? Has tons and tons and tons and tons of transistors. Uh, that was actually a joke <laughs> because, because Gordon Moore owned Intel and he made this plot. Intel employee is like, okay, every single year, we need to be able to cram the double number transistor on the logic to keep the Moore's law alive. Um, these days, this change a little bit. It is not like double every two years anymore. There's physics involved, but still, we keep adding transistor. Uh, you can check out the original paper that was back in 1965, a long time ago. But you might be asking, like, who don't care? Why? What's the benefit of more transistor? Anyone want to guess? Why do we want more transistor? More power. So what, what do you mean by more power? Will my computer get faster? More computing power. So that's a great answer, right? I have more computing power. Some example of that is Instead of me being able to do one ad per one second, I can now do two ads per one second because I have more transistor to build an adder. So now I have two adders. So I have two logic that can add in parallel. I can do that. I can do a lot of things with my transistor. I can add more cash. So what do you know about having more cash? faster program, right? So I can use more of the cache. So more transistor, basically think of transistor as your primary resource on your computer that you can use for any, for well, most, most purposes. You can build logic out of the transistor. So if you can cram more transistor, you can keep doing this and make computer faster and faster and faster and faster. Uh, I actually do have one optional reading. This was uh, more like a trend paper uh, written by Yale Pat. Uh, he was writing an article that talks about back in 2001, he basically said, hey, we should work on this topic because it's gonna be a trendy topic and it would make computer faster. It would unblock some of the bottlenecks we've seen so far in modern computer program back in 2000. You can see how many of them come true. I think quite a lot of them comes true, right? The the way we design computer chips change a lot. So anyone, I don't want to ask this question, but anyone remember back in 2000, 2004, 2005, where we say, hey, we have Pentium, Pentium 2, Pentium 3, and Pentium 4. Remember those old times? So what changed in each generation? What are those all about? What is the difference between Pentium 3 and Pentium 4? Oh, is that too long? <laughs> yeah, I, I figured that might be a little bit too long because that was like 15 years ago. Oh, actually that's 20 years ago. Sorry, my bad. That was when, when you guys were born. Oh crap, I'm old. <laughs> so back in the day, instead of talking about how many core do I have in my CPU, people talk about what's the clock speed. So I have a single core with one gigahertz clock. Actually, I do remember my computer, Pentium 2 computer, has a 800 megahertz clock, if I remember correctly, or something along that line. And then they become one gigahertz, 1.5 gigahertz, two gigahertz, single core, one core only. And when you keep making the clock faster and faster and faster. And then around 2003, 2004 comes in. Intel realized that, hey, we can keep doing this because it used a lot of power. At some point, you're gonna need a nuclear power plant to power your CPU. And we don't want that, right? So multi-core comes into play. Now you have a computer chip with four cores, eight cores, six cores, 12 cores, right? 
and and become the new trend. And now, if you look at the M1 and M2 from Apple, what do you see? What do you see? So the Apple chip doesn't have the core of the same size anymore. They have big core and small core, right? The Intel chip has the GPU integrated to the CPU core. So things evolve over time. So that's why I, I, I love the question at the beginning of this class, like, will there be a better GPU than the 3090? And my answer is always yes. Uh, that's a great question because if you look at the current technology, you say, hey, that's awesome. That's a really, really, really powerful hardware. But then in two years, there'll be a new thing coming out that is even better. And this will keep coming, right? Because we can design the hardware. We have the ability to design the hardware. If you look at modern computer, you have things like the Raspberry Pi, right? So if you are taking the... Uh, IoT class, I believe Ajahn Piti would ask you to program on these things, right? These are embedded devices, low power, but it's quite powerful. You can do a lot of things with them. You can have a GPU and use it to play games. I can use it to train machine learning model. I can go full blown, have a cluster of computer. These are super computer. Uh, this is a picture from Lawrence Livermore National Lab in the US. And there's quite a lot of those. In fact, uh, Thailand also have one as well. Uh, actually, quite quite a lot of supercomputer, but there's like one of them there where you researcher in Thailand can use and run their programs on. Um, you can have the mobile phone, uh, mobile, right? Which kind of change how you look at phones? Because if I talk to you guys, I don't think anyone here used a flip phone before, right? Anyone? Like an old Motorola phone or Nokia. Ah, you see your dad used one. Uh, anyone know about the Nokia meme where it's like it never breaks? Yeah, I can tell you, I, I can assure you it does rarely break. I did drop it through like staircase and it still doesn't break. But yeah, back in the day, we used a phone to call people, and that's it. And nowadays, your phone is a tiny little computer that is really powerful, right? It's actually really, really, really powerful. You can have things like a GoPro, which doesn't do much besides image processing, storing the video feed to the storage and upload it so that your friends can see all the crazy things you're doing. Right, and you can have something like this. Uh, so for those of you who have seen the slide before, uh, these are quantum computer, right? It might become another possibility of how you run a program. Uh, right now, it's still kind of like in a niche area where certain set of application would be really, really fast to run on this thing. Uh, but there's still quite a lot of advancement on this topic as well. So we'll see how it goes. Um, on top of that, right? Now let's go back to a normal computer. I want to introduce a really important concept called the von Neumann model. This is the way you write programs. To be honest, the technical definition of this is called the store program computer. It's a store program computer. If you break down this word, if you don't want to remember what the heck does it mean, it's a computer that store the program in the memory. That's it. You store the program in the memory. And it does have two key properties, which makes sense. I store the program in memory and all the data also is in the memory. And it has, this is a, a pretty unique one, sequential instruction processing. I process one instruction at a time. Remember assembly code that you have uh, in uh, system skill? Anyone still remember that? Remember the program counter?
So let's say I am at line number two and I just finished running line number two. What is the next line I'm running? Yeah, program counter is basically saying, right now we're at line number two. Once I'm done, which line am I running? Three, yes. So we run line by line by line by line. So that's the unique unless it's a jump. Thank you, that's perfect answer actually. Unless you have a jump, you you go line by line by line. That's one Neumann. So it's named after a person. What it does, you run the program line by line by line by line, right? So when you look at going back to this like input output processing unit, the CPU, right? The memory, the control unit, the coming back to our system skill lecture, you have the program counter and register, right? They store the data and tells where's the next line of your program. That's where your programs are. This is where your program are in the memory. The program counter would point to, okay, we are running line number two right now. What is the instruction in line number two? Send that to the CPU process it, deal with the register, right? To do the add, to do the multiply, then write the result back to the memory. Then what? Once we are done, what, what's the next step? We go to line number three. We go to the next line. That's it, right? Simple. Again, run line by line by line by line. Is that the only model? No. In the next lecture, we will talk about the model called, called the data flow model, which is what your modern CPU is imitating. The reason behind that, data flow model is faster than one Neumann model, but it's more complicated to program. Von Neumann from the programming point of view is the most dominant, Unless you are taking the parallel and functional programming class right now, or had taken it earlier. Anyone use Rust before? Or Scala? So for those of you who talk, take the class right now, <laughs> those, are, those functional programming or uh, functional language would match much better with the data flow model Everything is treated as inputs coming in. Do I have all the input? I run it right away. Von Neumann, more like C and Java and Python, line by line by line. Once I'm done line number 10, I'm going to run line number 11, then line number 12. And all the major ISA today, like Edit6, ARM, MIPS, and everything, use this model. Next lecture, we'll talk about the alternative called the data flow model. Next lecture. So that's a wrap for today's lecture. Uh, sorry about using all the time. Until 4 o'clock, usually we'll have some spare time. I got a little bit too excited about uh, why caring about architecture. <laughs> um, so any questions before we uh, call it done for today? <laughs>